Hello, I'm Pastor Chuck Salstad, Senior Pastor of Center Points Christian Fellowship. We are now in part two of the Rapture of the Church Studies, and where we are looking at the timing of the Rapture, when it's going to happen. See, our current discussion is on viewpoint number four, Mid-Tribulation and Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. As I stated in other lessons, I have a view of the Rapture that I personally subscribe to that I believe is the most consistent with a literal interpretation of biblical prophecy. The pre-tribulation view points to prophetic chronological clues that indicate that the rapture will take place prior to the tribulation period. Now, there are basic uh, beliefs about when the rapture will happen. They all relate to the tribulation of the end times, which according to most believers, using a literal translation of the Bible, is the last seven years before Christ returns to the earth. Now today, we're going to complete our examination of the second view in the viewpoint number four that covers the pre-wrath rapture. The pre-wrath belief, uh, which sees the rapture and the return of the Lord as one event sometime in the second half of the tribulation, immediately followed by a shortened time of great tribulation. Now let's begin this examination of viewpoint number four by looking at the summation of the pre-wrath rapture tribulation uh, and its belief system. The primary teachings of the pre-wrath uh, tribulation rapture are the first three and one half years of Daniel's 70th week, they say are the beginning of sorrows, but do not constitute any wrath of God, only the trials and tribulations of life. In fact, they assi assist or insist that the word tribulation is never used for the first half of Daniel's 70th week, and therefore we should not use it. Uh, the, the tribulation, the first large portion of the 70th week, is not the wrath of God, they say. It's the wrath of the Antichrist. The term great tribulation applies to a second period of Daniel's 70th week for which there is an intense tribulation or persecution of Christians. Now, this period lasts an indeterminate amount of time, but less than three and a half years, they say. And they say most of the diagrams that they have show it ending halfway somewhere uh, between the middle and the last part of the last three and a half years of Daniel's 70th week. And they say the first six seals cover the time from the beginning of Daniel's 70th week until the end of the Great Tribulation, but roughly about five and one quarter years, not the whole seven is what they say. In their entirety, they constitute the wrath of man throughout Antichrist. And the sixth seal, they say, marks the coming of the cosmic signs that precede the trumpet judgments. They also say that Michael is the restrainer of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that holds uh, the, back the Antichrist. The restrainer holds back the Antichrist from coming to power. And the Lord raptures, they say, the church near the end of the period of the time known as Daniel's 70th week, just prior to the onset of God's wrath. And the day of the Lord is the time of God's wrath that roughly uh, covers the last half of the three and a half uh, years of Daniel's 70 week, the second half. So about three quarters in, into the tribulation. And then they say this follows the rapture of the church. And this time of wrath, they say, as God pours out his anger upon mankind, including Israel and the nations, they say is just in the last fourth of the tribulation period. Now, this time of God's wrath, they say, extends past the, the uh, end of the tribulation, about 30 days uh, after the end of Daniel's 70th week, as God's bold judgments are poured out on the nations who persecuted Israel. Well, let me tell you, what, how God deals with the people that, that did what they did during the tribulation period is not part of the tribulation. It's afterwards. So the, the judgments are going past the end of the tribulation. But that's what they say. They say this third day period, 30 day period is based upon Daniel 12, 11, But I teach about that when I talk about the tribulation period. It's not the same as what they're talking about here. Daniel 12, 11 says, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolation is set up, they, are, they shall be 1290 days. Now, note, the pre-tribulation rapture or the, the pre-wrath rapture, excuse me. Believers are mixing up events and timing and eschatology by trying to fit the rapture into their theory. They're trying to make it so that they move the timeline around, that what it's talking about. They're trying to, to, to mix it all together so it will make their 
theory makes sense. But see, that's not the way the Bible is written. The Bible is written for us to be able to interpret what the Bible says, literally seeing what it's talking about, not making up things when it doesn't fit what we believe it might do. So that's why I want to give you uh, my opinion on the opposition to the pre-wrath uh, rapture teaching. See, Robert Van Campen and Marvin Rosenthal have come up with an interesting but incorrect theology that is flawed at its very foundation. Everything is based on their idea of when the wrath of God is unleashed during the tribulation period. They, they, they say, first of all, let's look at the word tribulation. Rosenthal rejects the use of the term tribulation period, which he says pre-tribulationalists have turned into a technical term. They've made this term up, and they say that the truth is that the pre-tribulationalists don't even use this phrase as a technical term, but in other words, they try to build a theology around that term. They said instead, pre-tribulationists use it as a descriptive term. And we've seen that scripture describes the 70th week of Daniel as a seven-year period characterized by wrath, judgment, fury, and a whole lot more. Well, the pre-tribulationists believe that only portion of the tribulation is really the wrath of God. And they say the term tribulation period is therefore an accurate uh, description or designation for it. Uh, but what happens is they say it shouldn't be called that. It's only a part of the period of time. They say the tribulation comes from Satan and that only judgment comes from God near the last part of the tribulation period. But that is not a correct scripturally. The tribulation and God's wrath. Let's look at this. Pre-tribulationalists believe that God's wrath is poured out on the earth long before and prior to the seventh seal. We believe it starts happening right away. Zephaniah uh, chapter 1 verse 15 describes the entire future tribulation period as a day of wrath, uh, is that day as a day of distress and anguish and a day of ruin and devastation and a day of darkness and of gloom and a day of clouds and thick darkness. Understand that this is from Zephaniah. It's talking about the whole period of time, not just a certain period. The entire tribulation period is characterized by God's wrath. From the beginning to the end, it gets progressively worse as it goes. But they just say, the pre-wrath people just say it's from near the very end of the tribulation. The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 that Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. And notice the article, the definite article, the. See, in English, definite articles are not significant. But in the Greek language, they are extremely significant, very important. Many believe that the wrath points to a definite and specific period of wrath. This period of wrath is properly interpreted as being the entire seven-year tribulation, which in other scriptures is called the time of Jacob's trouble. We see that in Daniel 9.27, Jeremiah 30, verse 7. We see that in Revelation 6.17. We see it in Revelation 14.7, and also verse 10, and in Revelation 19.2. See, the seven seals is another thing. The seven seals and God's wrath. The Bible pictures the seven seals are all coming as a sequence from the same ultimate source, and that source is God. We see it in Revelation chapter 6, and also we see it in Revelation 8, 1 through 5. I mean, this sequence features divine judgments that increase in intensity with each new seal. These are judgments by God. Who opens the seals? Christ does. Human beings and warfare are instruments of God's wrath during the first six seal. God uses them to, to enact those seals. But even the unsaved who experience this wrath it recognize it as the wrath of the Lamb. We see that in Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. So I've stated before, in speaking about the mid-trib rapture teaching, when I talked about that, this recognition is appropriate for Christ himself. The Lamb of God opens each seal, releasing each judgment. I talked about it here and in the, in the prior one uh, that we talked about, the mid and, and the uh, uh, later on we see that in the pre-wrath. But if you look at Revelation 6, 1, verse 3, verse 5, 7, 9, 12, and Revelation 8, 1, you'll see more about that. 
So to argue that the wrath of God does not begin until the seventh seal does not appear scripturally correct. And it is definitely a misinterpretation of the word of God. So I reject the, uh, the pre-wrath rapture theory because it does not line up with scripture. The word wrath is not used until the seventh seal, but that does not mean that God's wrath has not fallen prior to the time, because when you look at the word and it calls that whole time the wrath of God, we know that that's what it's talking about. The word wrath does not appear in Genesis, yet God's wrath was poured out during the flood. Look at Genesis 6 through 8. And on Sodom and Gomorrah, we see that in Genesis chapter 19. So in Bible times, People often experience God's wrath even when the word wrath is not used in the biblical text. Pre-wrath components say that during the first six seal judgments, people suffer the wrath of man, not the wrath of God. However, again, notice that Christ is the one who unrolls each seal, thereby initiating each judgment on earth. I mean, this is a clear instance of God this is Christ doing this, using human agency as a means of expressing his wrath. God has often used man in the past to hand out judgment. When God needed to chasten the Israelites in the Old Testament times, he sent them into captivity under the Assyrians and the Babylonians. God's wrath was expressed through human beings. This implies that those on earth who experienced the sixth seal judgment recognize it directly as the wrath of the Lamb. We also need to understand that each of the four horsemen of the apocalypse is released when the Lamb opens a seal, and one of the four living creatures who descends from the very presence of God says, Come. That's not mankind. This is Jesus releasing this judgment. This too indicates that the seal judgments are expressions of the wrath of God. See Revelation chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. See, the first four sealed judgments are typical of the expressions of divine wrath in the Bible days. They are the sword, famine, pestilence, and wild beasts. The argument that the sealed judgments represent only the wrath of man is unsustainable and weak. You know, look at Leviticus 26, 22, and also verse 25, Deuteronomy 28, 21 through 25, Jeremiah 15, 2, 3, 16, 4, Ezekiel 5, 12, and 17, and Ezekiel 14, 21. The next thing that we need to look at then, you put all the scriptures together to help you, is to look at the day of the Lord. The expression, the day of the Lord, denotes a time in which God actively controls and dominates history in a direct way, instead of working through secondary causes. God does this. The day of the Lord is characterized by God's activity intervening supernaturally in order to bring judgment against the sin of the world. God doesn't mess around here. God is using, he's the one bringing the judgment. The New Testament writers use the term to describe the judgments that will be unleashed in the future seven-year tribulation period. See, most prophecy experts believe that the day of the Lord is properly placed after the rapture in conjunction with the beginning of the tribulation period. You look at 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, 1 Thessalonians 5.2-2, 2 and 2, uh, Thessalonians 2.2, 2, and 2 Peter 3.10. The pre-wrath tribulationists reject the idea that the day of the Lord is after the rapture and call it the single greatest error people make in terms of proper timing of the rapture. And as we've seen, pre-wrath tribulationists also believe in three periods within the 70th week of Daniel. They divide it in half, then they divide that half into, into twos, and they say the wrath comes in the very last part. But see, the beginning of the sorrows lasting three and a half years and the great tribulation uh, lasting 21 months and the third quarter of Daniel's 70th week uh, would be the day of the wrath, the day of the Lord also lasting 21 months, the last quarter of Daniel's 70th week. They say that's when it is, but it's actually covering the whole time. See, they say which allegedly begins with the opening of the seventh seal in Revelation 8, but we know it begins at the beginning. Contrary to, to this view, Scripture typically points to the entire tribulation period as constituting the day of the Lord. You know, just look at Joel 2, 1 and 2. 
The day of the Lord includes the first six seal judgments, contrary to what the mid-tribs or the, uh, even the, the pre-wrath tribs say. But Rosenthal, he claims that the first six seals rep of judgment represent the wrath of man, but some of the judgments are clearly beyond the capability of, the ma of mankind because Jesus is the one that sets them into motion, not man. Revelation 6, uh, 12 through 14 says, When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth, and the full moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale, and the sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. I mean, that sounds pretty devastating. Man can't do those things. How can this possibly be categorized as the wrath of man? This is clearly the wrath of God, which occurs before the fourth quarter of Daniel's 70th week, as the pre-wrath uh, believers teach. Each of the seven seals is opened by Jesus Christ and represents the wrath of the Lamb. And to say that the wrath of God does not fall until the seventh seal makes no sense. It does not line up with scripture. And as the pre-wrath position has gained adherence and expositors, it has naturally undergone further development. To some degree, this is a matter of interpretation. Everyone who approaches the Bible brings opinions and suppositions with them. And once a person is convinced of a position, any position, they will search to discover evidence of that position, even if it's wrong. Their proponents, proponents can be quite dogmatic, coming down on you and accusing you that you're wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's horrible. Sometimes they lack in substance, they make up in insistence. And that's not just this view. This is a viewpoint of a lot of people. But if their proof texts cannot be shown to uh, like they are, what they're doing is they're stretching a point and they're ignoring or truncating pertinent information for, for or, or even more, resting more on assumption than on exegesis, knowing what the passage really says. Because if they do that, then no amount of insistence is convincing. They just can't convince you if you really know the word of God. But they try to, to mix it in so they, and then just be insistent about it and to scare people off or to push them back from even disagreeing with it. But the failure to properly cross-reference the Bible and obvious attempts to avoid contrary passages that don't go with what your belief is, it sheds light on the fact that the pre-wrath position cannot deal honestly with the Bible without picking some verses and avoiding others. And when you do that, it's false teaching. Now, to conclude, the pre-wrath uh, and the mid-tribulationalist uh, teachings present an inadequate theological system. It just doesn't line up with scripture. You can't make a theology of it. They set up their own views as indisputable and beyond contradiction. You can't argue with them. You know, and, and something like that, such dogmatism and unteachable narrow-mindedness should always re raise a red flag in our minds. That's why I teach these things. You need to be able to find those red flags and wave them when you see that something doesn't line up with Scripture. The two views are a good example of how these positions are dependent on assuming a conclusion while ignoring the text that should would undermine their position. So I disagree with the mid-tribulationalist and pre-wrath tribulation rapture teachings because they do not line up with Scripture. It's not proper exegesis. They're not pulling the meaning out of the, of the Scripture and what they're believing in. See, neither belief system synchronizes with all the biblical data on the rapture that we have. Okay, so I'm going to close for now. I, I hope you understand more about what, what the mid-trib and the uh, pre-wrath people uh, teach and understand it. So I'm going to close for now, but our next lesson, starting next week, is going to be examining the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We'll start going over that and, and to give a, a good, clear view of the pre-tribulation view. I'm not telling you what you have to believe, but what I am saying is whatever you believe should be based on scriptural uh, uh, research 
it, it should line up with scripture. And I say, you've got to take a literal view unless the Bible says something different because you have to be able to prove what the text says. So I don't want to be hard. I just want, I just want us to make sure we understand and that we're good stewards of the word and that we're showing ourselves approved. So uh, I, I appreciate you joining in with me on this um, teaching today. And I want to encourage you, uh, if you want to find out more about Center Points Christian Fellowship, visit our website at www.centerpoints.org. On our website and on YouTube, uh, in the narrative on both of those, you can find uh, where our YouTube channel is and what the um, uh, address is so that you can plug in to watch our videos. Because uh, this link to this uh, video is in YouTube and Facebook. But you can find all of my videos there on Facebook by just going to www or excuse me www.youtube.com forward slash at cpcf forward slash videos and you'll find all my videos there. So and, and if you want to hear more about our weekly newsletter updates or find out about our Wednesday night Bible study or our Thursday morning women's Bible study. Just uh, send me an email at info at centerpoints.org and I'll get back with you so that you'll have a link to be able to plug in there with us. Uh, it's a great time and we'd love to have you. So uh, what I need to do, let's, let's pray. I, I want to make sure we close in prayer. So Lord, we just thank you for today. We ask that you'd bless us, uh, guide us, help us to be the stewards of of the gospel, the stewards of the word of God, that we would be good stewards, good caretakers of what your word says, and that we will interpret it correctly, that we will follow uh, what the Bible says, study to show ourselves approved. Help us to do that today and help us to be the best scholars that we can be uh, in, in the word of God. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. In your precious holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, thank you for joining in with me today. And if you'd like uh, to hear anything more from me, like I said, send me an email at info at centerpoints.org and I will get back with you. So until I see you again, stay safe and may God bless you and have a great day.